today, I've come down to my friend Terry, Sue Pat. It's art exhibition. Terry, tell me about this exhibition. What's it called for starters? Uh, it's called uh, School's Out. School's Out. Uh, and essentially, it's, it's uh, a, retro- a retrospective. A retrospective of uh, uh, some of the more popular characters in, uh, in Grange Hill. Obviously, you're there. Thank you. Um, and we've got... Uh, I've, I've amalgamated with two fantastic... Uh, artists, one called Cranksy, yeah, and uh, and Dave Nash, who uh, does kind of freehand, and uh, as you can possibly see today, um, uh, it's quite it's quite good when when it all comes together. When did you first realise you had a talent for art? I first started off doing kind of collages, and then went to a place called Graphic yeah. in Notting Hill, and uh, saw quite a lot of Banksies. And uh, just the, the major kind of players on the street, really. And um, they kind of asked me if I fancied doing some stencil work, which I went away and, and attempted to do. And here it is. I mean, you know, you say stencil work, and Banks is, you know, quite well known for. Well, yeah. You know, he's probably the most well known in, yeah. in, in the business. I grew up with that graphic art and graffiti art, you know. With spray cans, did you yeah. not ever think about doing that sort of stuff on walls and stuff? Or, well, n- no, not really. I, it, it's, um, I was more into doing things on canvas, really. Um, I have been on the walls at some point, but we've all, um, we've all done it on the wall, too. <laughs> yes, but um, I, I, I quite like the idea of, of, of bringing groups of people together uh, and, and um, moving it around different areas so on canvas really kind of suits me at the moment you know so I mean what do you think like the future is for for stencil art and your work um well hopefully um it it gets bigger larger um and hopefully we can kind of move this exhibition around um that that would be my my um ambition really but it's just really nice to get all the old lot together including yourself thank you for inviting me down to yeah and um and it's my birthday, so we, I think we're going to have a really good time. Just a question, too. I mean, I've, I've been looking at... I mean, I'm a great fan of art, and I love the Tate and stuff like that, and I love all the great artists. Do you think that people will be looking at your work, Banks's work? Do you think that would be up in the National Portrait Gallery? So, so well, d- d- actually, that's a very interesting question, because I'm a great believer in the idea that, that art is kind of temporary, and it kind of suits me at the moment that, that you can walk around London or wherever you are, and there are pieces on the wall, and two weeks later they won't be there. Um, That's because so, the council's painted over them. Yeah, but it, it's 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 that idea that, that that art is for everybody and it is accessible to everybody. You don't have to go to a, to a, to a major gallery, uh, and it's temporary. It's not going to be there all the time. So um, th- I really like that that concept. We still haven't answered my question. Do oh, you no, honestly I think that? This graphic work, the stencil work, will be in the National Gallery in 2020. Well, I, I, well, it's the thing, you know, um, that uh, the first basic kind of art work was hands-on caves, uh, which essentially is stencil. And that's the point. I mean, gra- graffiti art has been around for forever. You know, the, Absolutely. The yeah. Romans, the ancient Greeks. Yeah. It's always been made for political and statements. Political statements and, uh, you know, it's the idea that... the, the, the we can all make art in our bedrooms. It's a bit like the idea that we can all make music in our bedrooms now, and that's the kind of uh, way I think art is now progressing. Also, I quite like the, um, you know, the the other types of art, you know, like uh, film, music, all that kind of thing. But um, it doesn't necessarily have to be on canvas. Well, I'm joined outside by an old sparring partner of mine, an old mate of mine, and still friends, to be honest. It's Mr. George Armstrong. Now, this guy. Am I going to like this? Well, I don't know. You All might right. do. Which you might know as Alan Humphreys. And he had so many names. They, he was so good they named him three times, if I'm yeah, right. you are right. George, you got your part in Grain Jill. I mean, you were a bit older than a schoolboy when you joined the cast. Yeah, I started when I was 15. Uh, Todd was 14. Terry was 13. Right, so yeah. we were all a year apart. Never met each other until the first day. 13th of August, 1977. Full of Rain Men characters out of you. Yeah, reach, yeah, I'm sad. <laughs> and, and you know what? You know when you first did it. I mean, I spoke to Terry, and he said like he didn't realise how big the success was going to be. I mean, did, how did you feel about the show? 
For us, it was a it was a six episode docudrama for the Beep. Um, we were going to go in, do the six episodes. It was up until October. We all had to go and get our licenses back then, um, and we were done. And halfway through filming, they upped it to nine, and that was what we thought was the end of it. And then suddenly it came onto our TV. Thirty screen. years later, <laughs> well, we talk about thirty years later in a second. But you know, suddenly it came onto our screens, and the public was gripped. Basically, they weren't at first, but suddenly they did. No, they were at first, and I suppose what really appealed was the fact that it was the first show on British kids TV that was something that every kid could relate to. Every kid was going to school, every 11 year old was starting their secondary education. They didn't know what the fuck they were going to expect, so that's what they did. And then suddenly, everybody loved it, everybody started to love it. Well, I did when I joined it, I mean, I don't know about you when you was in it. It was... I think it was after about the second series, so it was, we'd just finished the second series, so it was about the time that Lee and, you, no, no it wasn't it Lee, been, been Mark, Peter, Mark and those guys, yeah. Paula, all of that lot joined. Yeah. Um, and already we were doing loads, you know, we were already doing the school fates, we were, we had finished the second series and at that stage we got 10 million viewing figures, which at the time was amazing. Was unheard of. The only thing that got close was Blue Peter and that was watched by everybody back then. So to suddenly be doing that and doing those very figures, having private parties signed for us at the B because we were doing that well, getting BAFTA nominations because we're doing that. Nominations, see I got the BAFTA. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Yeah, where I mean, did you get it? 1986. <laughs> where, no, where did you get it? I was at the Grosvenor House Hotel. <laughs> oh, you collected, did you? No, I wasn't there. I mean, I was, I was there at the Grosvenor House, but it wasn't given to me in Pacific. It wasn't just for me, you know, it was for the show. It was for the show. And so I think that was what the key to Grange Hill was. It was the show. You know, there was, yeah, you had your Todds, you had Whatever Grippers, you had them all. But it, at the end of the day, people related with the cast, not with one character. No, that's true. I mean, they just loved every single character yeah. from the show. And that's what kept it going for as many years as it did. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> and then after, do you think that when I came to, because I did one of my first scenes with you and Todd, if I remember rightly. The Mars bar the scene Mars under bar a bike scene, shade. Under a bike shade. <laughs> and do you think that your time had come? Do you think that the, the writers could have took you out more? You were just like in three episodes and that was it, really. We it did, like no we did first year, third year, and three episodes in the fifth year. And that was it. And that was around the fact, I think... Um, you were like 27. It was, it was that. <laughs> um, they had the plans for us because they'd already planned the spin-off, so they, we true. were moving on to Tuckers. Tuckers so there was, luck, that, yeah. there was that to do. But, but more than that, I think Newcast had come in and they were kind of trying to sell that a lot more. To so the, all of a sudden, generation, next, generation, next, generation, next generation, next... And that was the key to it. You know what? At the end of... Every year, a new set of 11 year olds join school. And that's why the TV show worked so well, I suppose, Lasted. for 30 years. And then, like you said, you, you did Tucker's Luck, which was like really gritty at the time. If I remember rightly, it was a lot of unemployment, a lot of, lot of unemployment. coming yeah. of age, sort of. Um, it was all about coming of age, wasn't it, really, in a way? To like a American Pie without the talent. Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, for us, it was a little bit of a disappointment, I think, in some ways. When we originally signed up for it, this was supposed to be nine o'clock, full language, being able to really do the hardcore, gritty stuff. Yeah. Um, and at the end of it, they put it on at six o'clock on the afternoon on a, on a Tuesday or a Thursday. And, uh, yeah. All of a sudden, you know, the plan was that it was going to be realistic. It was going to be the language rather than so the flipping bit, X. You felt like a bit let down by it, really, didn't you? By and it, it, it kind of drifted then because it wasn't allowed to deal with some of the tougher subjects that you went on to deal with about three years later. Yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, we did have some good storylines. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I must admit, we were very, very lucky. I think you, of all the year groups, had probably the best storyline of them all. And we were very lucky. I mean, yeah. I must admit that. So, you did Grain Chill, you did Tucker's Luck. Then what happened? Then what happened? Um, was it rehab? <laughs> no, it was drama school. I thought I'd better learn what I'm doing. No, I went. I, no, no, I, I moved backstage. I moved into technical theatre, lighting design, and you camera worked, technique. You worked to some some of the best girls' schools in the country. 
and some of the best boys' schools in Australia. No, that I'd never know. Yeah, no, so when I was did you get in. Deported from there, then. I went there in '93, and I was there for a year and a half in Perth. And then we haven't seen you on our TV screens until this year, when we got a call out the blue last <laughs> yeah. year. Would we like to go to Todd's funeral? Funeral. That was a bit of a shock. <laughs> and if the people didn't know, we got asked to be in a. A little show, well it's a big show, it's, big become, show. it's, it's become very, very popular. It's very, very popular. Very, very funny, very, very well, add me and stitches when I read the script. Touch of You got more I've only got a page. Well, well, I, I saw a bit of the script, but yet again I didn't get no no words because I think they wanted me No, to you just, sobbed well though, just, I saw I'm, you crying. I'm a good crier. You are a good crier. I, mean, I remember. Was, what was it like to go to <laughs> Todd's funeral and what was it like to work with like Terry Supat again and It's always lovely to see Terry anyway, you know, he's he's one of those guys who comes into your life and he kinda of stays there he forever. Was, yeah. And we bump into each other at least once a year, normally on Walthamstow Market. No, the station, the normally. Station. Is it sober? <laughs> no, never. Are you? No, very rarely. Um, so it's always good to see Terry. It's always good to have events like this one. Um, for those who don't know, we're at Grain Chill Art Exhibition. Where three talented artists have done, created some amazing There's work. There's some lovely artwork in there. Some I've already had work. a look. And if we could, we were richer, we'd buy them. <laughs> If we had any money, if we, if we had it any is a money. recession. It is a recession. Maybe they can just do it on the back of a matchbox for us. Yeah. If we're lucky. Listen, George, always a pleasure. Thanks it's for joining fun, ME1 TV, buddy. My pleasure, my friend. Cheers. Well, I'm joined by my old nemesis. Wow, how about that? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Savage, just a quick one, mate, because I know you're in a rush for your play tonight. Good luck with that, by the way. Thank you. Um, Mark, you did Grange Hill at the same time as me. What was it like? Be honest. I mean, I've, I've told people my version, but what's your version? Oh, it was murder work and working with all you kids. It was a nightmare. Oh, no. No, of course, it was It was fantastic, wasn't it? It was, it was a dream job, I think, for all of us, really, wasn't it? You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was, a, <clears throat> it was a good experience in life. Yeah. And you was in the show for, what, five years? Six five years. Five years, and you had, a, you had a part, didn't you? Yeah, that was amazing. It was great fun. I mean, completely yeah. different from who you are as a person. I like to think so, Erkan, yeah. You, you did the character Gripper for the viewers out there who didn't know. Gripper was a bastard. Yeah, put it bluntly, yeah. And unfortunately, people thought he was real. They did, yeah. Uh, and if I'm right, going back to memories of me and you talking over the years, a lot of people on the street treated you like Gripper. Yeah, yeah, you got that part of it as well, yeah. I think everybody, I think if you're in the public eye, you get that anyway, though. I mean, probably more so if you're playing a baddie, obviously. Nothing wrong with playing a baddie, mate. No, it's great playing a baddie. And it is great. I mean, it, for, for acting-wise, it's a good good thing to do anyway, isn't it? It's really great. Absolutely, of course it is, yeah. You know, and we've had some, we had some brilliant scenes together, and, you know, and now you're, you're in your, you've been acting and doing all your short films and stuff like that. So, I mean, what's the play you're doing now? It's called Squeaky Clean. Um, runs at Wimbledon until the 21st of September, um, 7.45. And it's sort of, it's a, a bittersweet comedy. It's what it's being billed as. It's uh, played the part of someone who's been made redundant. His wife then, to make ends meet, takes up a phone sex line. Um, he's got a son, Alfie, who's sort of stripping the house and taking it to the... Uh, Drug dealers. Uh, no, to, to a, a charity. <laughs> he's a lovely bloke. No, it's Joe Atwell plays him. He's really great. Takes it to the local um, charity shop uh, because he's in love with a girl there. And it's, uh, yeah, like a little family drama. Well, it's, you know, I know you're in a rush, and thanks for joining us at ME1 TV today. I mean, it's a, it's a pleasure, and always a pleasure to meet up with you, Mark. And uh, hopefully next time we can chat a bit longer. Yeah, mate, definitely, of course. Pickles, lovely to see you again, pal. Well, you too, mate, always. Now, I know you was in Grange Hill. Many, you had a little part, am I right? Uh, yeah, earlier on I was in the, um, I was like an extra. I was always in the football team on the cricket team when it first started. And I went back into it like in the late 80s, I don't know, 88, 89. Yeah. Played a dodgy caretaker. I used to have a little card school and like a dance school and nick the money off the kids and told them I was rubbish. And had a pound out of them. Don't do that. Sold. Don't do that. No, yours. don't do that. Own. No, don't. You can do a lot, no. but don't do that. <laughs> so but been, I did me bit. And you've been an actor and you've been, you've been on our screens for... Oh, God, no, 40 odd years. I, I, did, well, I didn't on. really want to say how long. I know. Because he's, he's actually only 20, 23 I'm looking good. on his casting pictures. Yeah, I'm looking good for 72. He's, yeah. good. he's doing well. Now, Pickles, what have you been up to lately? Um, mate, I'm always busy, I you know, know you me. Are. Another day, I, another bluff, that's I, me. I hate um, you because you're so busy. I've just been on tour with a theatre company. I do a lot of stuff for Grey Eye Theatre Company. They are a disabled-led theatre company, um, and 
I did a show, a musical with them actually a couple of years ago, Reasons to be Cheerful, which is a musical based on Ian Jury's music. Brilliant. We did two national tours, it was like half gig, half show. So like a live band on stage and it followed the story of two guys um, trying to get tickets for see Jury at the Emmersmith Odeon. So it's like a fictionalised story, but just brilliant fun. And the Blockheads were really supportive and the family, Jury's kids, um, and Jemima and all came down and and the you know Jewish grandchildren and stuff and that was just brilliant fun, mate. And so then back by the family, really. Yeah, right? and and Jewish just finished his um, his art exhibition we were here right, today yeah. at the RCA, which finished last week, which was wonderful. Um, and a lot of that was in private collections, and they dug up all this old stuff of Jewish that had not been seen for years. After he died, um, Jemima found all this stuff in his loft and stuff that her and Baxter, who's um, Jewish son, he was under the, the cover of the New Boots and Panties. He's the little kid with Jewry in the shop window and things, you know, which is I'm trying to think would get me buried, but I don't think it was here. I was the other side of um, East London. But yeah, so that was brilliant. And it's just good to be here today. Another sort of art thing, just supporting mates and stuff. And this work is just wonderful. And that's the point, you know, it's nice to come down and see great artwork. Oh, no, it's great. I'm not obviously biased, but it really is good stuff, you know, from Terry and Krenkski and the guys. And it's just it's stuff that needs to be seen and be out there, really. A lot more people should be seeing it and buying it. Of course, it, it is. And, and you know, back, back to the theatre company. Cause <laughs> I, cause, sorry, because I, 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 this theatre company is a unique. Well, not, Grey Eye. Yeah, Grey Eye, they, they, they are. Like They've been going for about 30 odd years, um, early 80s. And they initially set up the early 80s as a sort of radical sort of disability awareness sort of theatre company, really, because it's well, pretty they, rubbish back then. Well, it still, is, mate. Still, it still is rubbish. You know, you know, in a lot of ways. No, I know. No. Who, who ain't got a disability being cast as somebody who's got a disability, which is a don't dreadful even, when there's mate, enough. Don't even go there. Don't even start That's, me on well, that one. It's just. Well, I have. loads of mates. Well, I know loads of mates who are disabled actors, and and it's you know, it's wrong when they're casting non disabled actors in disabled parts. It's a disgrace in my book. Well, especially when there are good actors out there. You know, I know loads. When well, Grey Eye, and they're, they're really good mainstream theatre company now, and they do their work. All over the world and things, and, and Jenny Seeley, who's the artistic director, she co-directed the opening ceremony of the Paralympics last year, and right, yeah. which we were lucky enough. I mean, I was working on it for four months, the build-up to that, just support. There was a group of 50 um, disabled professional performers, and they did two months of circus training in Oxton, um, circus yeah, school, Oxton yeah. Circus Space. So they did two months training and two months rehearsals at the um, Free Mills, the island. And then we did the show. So I was just supporting all those guys for four months. And then like, three days before the opening ceremony, the, the Paralympic opening ceremony, we went in and did that a little bit. We did Spasticus for, yeah, yeah, for yeah, reasons. Because right, yeah. we, you know, as a, as, a, as a company, we were a mixed company of disabled, non-disabled, um, actors, musicians and performers. So we got to do Spasticus in a stadium on the... Well, words can't describe you. You've got 80,000 people in the stadium. And supposedly like, a billion people watching it on the telly. It was just... Amazing. Mate, unbelievable. What a, what a buzz. Well, on that um, buzz. So, so yeah. So, Grey Eye, phenomenal company. And they are. Cheers. Well, listen, I'm going to let you get back and enjoy the art show. No, Thanks I'm for joining me to one today. No, mate, always and hopefully to see you. We'll have a lemonade sometime all, later on. Oh, all right. Cheeky shandy. Early night and a good Cheers. <laughs> this is all your beautiful work, but I know you just don't do grain chill stuff. I mean, you do. Not usually, no, mate. No. No. Well, you do, you do absolutely everything, and your work is going to be seen all over. Cool. I believe. Cool. Wicked. When did you first get into graffiti? Uh, back in 88. Um, obviously, I was a bit of a whippersnapper and I was doing it quite illegally. And I was obviously writing so completely different back then and tagging, bombing, stuff like that. And I kept getting caught, so I just give up, quite honestly. Uh, I was not a very good graffiti artist. Uh, I stopped and then went to college and uni and studied art. So when did this sort of all come back again? I mean, you know, when was this click that you thought, you know what, I'm getting back out there? I know exactly when, 2009 February. I remember that because um, my wife was pregnant with my son and my friend invited me out and said, oh, why don't we come out and go spray paint? I said, well, is it a bit dodgy? He's like, no, you can go, there's certain areas you can go spray painting now. And it's, so we went down to Tottenham with a bag of paint and spray painted the character. And then I thought, how do I sign this? So I just sort of signed it with my me, uh, me old nickname, Nasha, and that's it, it's just stuck. And I've noticed that you do like murals and you do stuff like, what's your inspiration? I mean, you know, or is it just if someone's going to pay you for, to do your work, you're going to do it now? Because, you know, obviously I know you do that for a living as well. Now. I do, yes. Uh, so they've obviously got a specific idea of what they want and I try and put my own spin on it, try and make it look like it's my own stuff. So, yeah, sure. but now, now it's like, it's big business now. Uh, graffiti, street art, whatever you want to call it. So, 
it's changed a lot since I was doing it back in the 80s, 90s. And that's it. I mean, you know, the first time I came into graffiti, that I noticed graffiti was obviously from the film Wild Style and yeah. Beach Street, these, these movies coming out of America. And, the, you know, the British artists went out and sprayed trains and wherever. I mean, you know, we yeah. all grew up with graffiti over the walls or in, in toilets and stuff. And, you know, that's the first time I've seen it. And, but the work's just moved on. Even down where we are today, which is Brick Lane, I mean, the, the oh. work down there is just... The top boy mural is just yeah, down the road just there. Down the road. Just I want to go and look at it again, you know what I mean? Because it's just beautiful. Same here. Just a quick question that I'm going to ask every artist that I speak to speak cool. tonight. Banksy. King Robbo. Which one? Robbo. All day long. There you go. You've heard it first. Nashi, thanks for joining us today. Cheers, mate. Nice one. Cheers, buddy. Well, I'm joined by the daddy. How you doing, John? I'm not too bad, Ergen. How are you, mate? I'm oh, very well. John, what brings you down to this art exhibition today? I mean, I know you was in Grange Hill. I mean, what did, who did you play again? I was uh, Tucker's big brother, and it was a it was a privilege to play that part. And um, I'm on M1 TV. ME1 TV. ME1 TV. So what brings you down to this art exhibition today, apart from the art? Um, the drink and uh, Terry Super, a very good friend of mine, very talented artist. Very, very talented artist. Perfect. John, always a pleasure to speak to you, buddy. OK. Go and grab a beer. You too, mate. Can I just show you this before I go? This is for Ray Winston. I'm here waiting for you, mate. Whatever, hey, ha whatever happened to Uncle Ray? <laughs> Terry, tell me about your time. I mean, because we worked together for a bit, well, I think two episodes. Yes. How did you get your interview uh, auditioned for, for the show? Actually, um, it, it was... Uh, I was playing football in the park. And uh, the then director, uh, Colin Kant, uh, saw me playing football. And uh, then I went over to the Anna Church Children's Theatre. And uh, I think he just had me earmarked for the part, really. And what was it like the first time that you walked on set? I mean, obviously, you didn't know what kind of show Grange Hill was going to be. No. Um, I kind of had reservations about it, really, because um, it was a series. And... Um, in actual fact, the very first ones weren't that popular. And, uh, and then steadily it grew uh, an audience. That's because I wasn't in it, folks. No, I understand <laughs> that. Tale. No, I mean, it did take its time to, to sort of come up. You know, yeah. people were shocked about you know, how Grain Chill was. And people thought, hold on, no one's going to watch a TV show about right. kids going to school. I mean, yeah. and then it, it sort of became a sort of hit. And then how did, that, how did it affect you? Well, it, it, it was quite strange, really, because... Um, I just wasn't used to it, really. Uh, and it was really a, a bit like being in a, a kind of pop group. You know, in that you got people chasing you down the street and um, just being recognised everywhere, really. I mean, you, you know, people, you, people chase you down the street. I, I never had people chase me, too, because <laughs> I, I never ran anywhere, you know, so that's the difference between you and I yeah. back in the day. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't this huge, huge show. And then, you know, I started back in 1982, I think, and you were coming to the, the last years of that. Yeah. Um, you was only in a couple of episodes. Do you feel the BBC and the script writers of Grange Hill let you guys down as characters that the viewer should have seen more of you? In actual fact, I kind of, I decided, I kind of got offered uh, Tucker's Luck yeah. after, after Grand Hill, but kind of turned that down because really I hadn't been to school and uh, decided that I wanted to do exams and essentially I really wanted to kind of um, go and do different work really, uh, stage work and uh, just things up and down the country really. And then suddenly the next thing I saw you on was The Firm. The firm, yes. I mean, how did that come about? I mean, you, um, I know you knew Gary before. I d actually, I didn't know Gary. Really? I d no, I, I knew Gary, obviously, yeah. by reputation. reputation yeah. um, but being a, a, a football fan myself, um, it was just Paul's really... a fan, Tottenham. <laughs> it was just a very interesting job. And Gary's a fantastic actor. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and most of the guys who were on that... Uh, were, were great to work with, fantastic to work with. That's just... So, I mean, once, you, once the, film, the, the firm went out, I mean, what was, when you used to go over to Tottenham, I mean, what was people's reaction? Well, you could, you, I think... Did you get chased down the street no. for another reason? No, no, I, you know, I'm not really into that. But, uh, it, you know, people kind of said it was gritty and it was true to life. So, you know, I, I think everyone did a really good job on that. And you yeah. worked on shows like Desmond and stuff like that. Um, but, tell, you know, we haven't really been seen on screen yourself for, for quite some time. And suddenly yeah. we both get asked to do uh, Sky Channel Touch of Cloth. I Touch mean, of that, Cloth, yeah. Which has had a big, you know, people love it. I mean, yeah. we were both there that day and we, we, we just read the script and we thought it was funny. Yes. I mean, how did you feel when they said to you, would you like to do 
Todd's funeral. Well, it's it's gonna come. <laughs> it would be a, yeah, but so sort of they preempted it. Yeah, but I, do you know what? I, I was just quite privileged to turn up with people like Anna Wing. And, rest her soul. Yeah, and um, actors I I kind of seen on a regular basis in the Bill and EastEnders. Do you know what I mean? And and obviously it was a laugh to do. So so, yeah. so what's next for you, Terry? Uh, I'm do I've just done something called Amar Akbar and Tony, which is a low budget British film uh, where I play a priest, which um, I love doing actually because I, I like getting dressed up. <laughs> so I mean, I know that you, you you got a call out the blue on that one. I did, yeah. Uh, I believe it was was it Valentine that gave you the no, was it, it was uh, Clint Dyer. Clint Dyer, Clint Dyer, Dyer my, my, my friend. Yeah, and Clint's really cool. Um, and and they just said, do you fancy playing a vicar? Which, which um, I couldn't I couldn't say no really. And you know you, you you do this small cameo piece and clip in this piece. I mean, was there any funny stories about when you were well, filming that? I kind of turned up on set at about eight o'clock in the morning, and decided, so you got early for a change. <laughs> got, got the early for a change, and then um, the, the the real vicar gave me his robes. And, but he wouldn't give me the collar, so we made one out of cardboard. But um, standing on the street uh, in West London at 9 o'clock in the morning, outside a pub, having a cigarette... Um, well, that's normal for Vickers down in West <laughs> London, if I'm right. <laughs> well, it, it, uh, uh, I remember a bus stopping and people just looking at me in complete disgrace, actually. We're joined outside by Sarah Lewis, the editor of my 80s dot uk, and she's been down to the art show today, and she's bought... Wow, look at this, people. She can't really see in the bubble wrap, but she's bought a piece. Why did you buy this piece in particular? Uh, I think it's the best one. I saw it on Facebook when Terry first put it up and uh, had my eye on it, walked in, went round, and no, it's still the best one. Really? And what did you think of the artwork to this evening? Amazing. I love the cranksy stuff as well. It's uh, very funny, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I but, love the ones with you as well. <laughs> I'm joined by Mr. Lee McDonald, uh, an old friend of mine from, what, 30 years ago, Lee? Ah, yeah, we don't say 30 years, but I think it's about 30 years. Lee, you played uh, Zamo, uh, a character on a TV programme called Grain Chill, am I right? I did. Zamo, it sounds like washing up liquid, but yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And then, basically, your character got drugs, really. Basically got into drugs, didn't they? Yeah, and the reason they used that character, because Zamo's character was a good character, and at the time they wanted to use somebody that was not a nasty character, because you couldn't think drugs and relate with that. It was a good character, got involved with the wrong crowd, and then got involved in drugs and it made it more realistic for people to think shit you know this guy's a good guy and he's got involved with drugs and obviously it was they wanted me to die in it but I couldn't because the audience was so young. Oh, it's a shame. You would have been gutted. I would have. No you well, would have been. You would have been. Personally I wouldn't have been but you may have been but I, <laughs> I wouldn't have been to be honest. I could have come um, back going Roland I love you Roland. And do you? <laughs> Well, I'm yeah, not on camera. <laughs> well, this is Mr. Lee McDonald. We've been friends for years. I'd like to talk to him longer on ME1 TV, but I don't want to bore our viewers. Anyway, always a pleasure to see him, my old mate. Lee, enjoy the night. <laughs> Have a good one. Look who we've got here. It's only Normski. Normski's turned up down East London to represent himself at Monty's Bar and our Granger Art Exhibition. What are you up to these days, buddy? I know you're still DJing, you know, you're doing your Oxton stuff, you know, bigging up Oxton, and Oxton's the place to be. Yeah. You know what I mean, you've come down today to support, represent, as you say. Yep. Photography's where you started, but uh, on the catwalks, am I right? Well, no, not really on the catwalks. I was always about street style, and I was very lucky in the 19, early 1980s, uh, having left school with absolutely nothing, I decided that my hobby at the time, which was uh, music, probably wasn't going to be the career move so I got a little t-boy job in a London rock shop on Chalk Farm Road sadly now it's a vintage clothes shop first shop that actually started selling synthesizers to all these newcomers now and uh, I was doing photography uh, as my sort of you know it's my like, kind of my real hobby and I started and studied uh, photography at Kingsway College uh, did that for a little while and I became a professional photographer I've now got work in the Victorian Albert Museum I'm very glad I got seven pieces of my work and uh, it's because I'm, you know, I'm young, black, and gifted, really. And I come from the streets of London, North West London, to be precise. And uh, here I am now, 2013, still doing it. He's just saw me take a little snapshot of your camera work. I love a bit of camera work. Uh, in the mid, early 90s, I got on television. Yeah, rap, rap, rap. Uh, Dance Energy. Dance Energy. Death 2, that's right. That's right, BBC 2. A channel yeah. within a channel. 
Yeah, I mean, Dance Energy was a big hit, and, and you know, it sort of it was, cult. Tried, it was a cult tried show. To capture like uh, the rave scene on TV, sort of didn't really, in my eyes, capture it. Oh, I wish it would have been well, later. The thing is, it did o'clock. actually. What it did is it reported back because the the rave scene was the mid '80s, and ten years later, it took ten years for TV to catch up. Thankfully, our show was the one that was able to uh, be the first ever television show in Great Britain and pro- probably the world to actually make a big deal about DJs, because in those days, DJs just stood behind the decks, played Turn music, and we yeah, all danced. Now well, now they've got a face, you see, and uh, I think at my show, and I've been told by many of them, that was responsible for a lot of people that are quite big in the game now, to actually have a, a you know a, a, a personality beyond just the, the earwaves, as it were. So uh, I'm very fortunate to be alive from last century to this century, and uh, some people have called me many things. I would like to call myself a renaissance man. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to stop there. I just thought I'd cut it for a no, second. That's fine. But basically, yeah, I've just come back from Switzerland. I was in Zurich for the International Radio Festival because I do do a weekly show on Hoxton FM. Uh, we went out there. Uh, International Radio Festival is a platform that's been provi- uh, sort of put together by some Swiss guys uh, to celebrate probably the most listened to musical format in the world, which is radio. Television to me is radio with pictures. And uh, we had it right, we got it right. And back in those days, Def Two days, you had Rough Guide, you had Rapido. Uh, you had some amazing stuff which documented what was going on exactly. at the time. Uh, and which is not now. There's no no TV company. I know. It, There's really well nobody watches telly. Everyone watches YouTube now. Everyone watches their PC. It's a mad world now. It's Internet changed. TV is the way. F- it is. It is. It is the way. It's not the way forward because no. we're already forward. I think it's it's a regression thing. It's the way backwards. What we need to do is we need to get back to the thing where we all go home at a certain time and watch something at a certain time. Of course now. You can do it on ID, or you can go back four months, or you can go forward. You know, it's, it's like no, so, disenfranchised is the word I'm thinking. So basically, of. do you think that it's killed family time as well? A so lot of people like have saying, still got yeah. the family, uh, you ethics. know, the ethics involved in their lives. But this, the way of the future is is very capitalistic. Me, me, me. So much so that the biggest telephone manufacturer and online uh, hardware manufacturer begins with the word I. Right, I'm not going to say who they are, but I, it's not like us phone, it's iPhone. You just said it. Sad, isn't it? Got but, to say it, people. But before I run, I, I did actually, yesterday during my research moments, I did actually have a look and see what was going on, because uh, the show London we do on Thursday from the Vibe Bar is all about celebrating what's going on in London, creatively, stylish, stylically, and musically. And uh, I did notice this thing that was happening here at Monty Bar, and what drew me in was Terry Super, because Legend. I grew up with that chap. Right, Legend. right. I grew up with that chap, and many other chaps just like him, and I, and we all love a bit of street art, but we all love art, whether it's on the street or off the street. Visual, we whatever. all love art. Everything is about art. Just a quick question. I've asked a lot of artists today this one, right? And you, you know, you're in the know. Two hundred years time. Yeah. Right. National Portrait Gallery. Yeah. Will we see any street artists from today showing in the National Portrait in two hundred years time? Well, I think the answer to that um, question is, is yes, because we already know that the great Banksy has already managed to walk into the MPG and play some street art amongst some of the quality artists of the last two centuries yeah. without being seen. So that is a, that is a, that is a yes, that's an obvious, that's a yes. Um, what's going to be beautiful is, is that um, galleries and museums are all about the history of the world. So it would be a real shame if, say for example, MPG, Tate, example, did not have stuff that represented right now where we are. Uh, I don't think that's not going to happen. I think it's going to happen and I'm really excited. Uh, I just wish I could be here in 200 years time. Uh, fortunately, I'm here now and I can go into any of these galleries and I can see what's and been going on for the last 500 years and plus. That's what it yeah. Norms, listen, pure pleasure to meet you. Enjoy the show. Normski, legend, but not as big as me. Uh, maybe not as big as you, but much broader. Check out 53. Listen, mate, Herbie. I'm broad. Herbie. I'm broad. I'm broader than Broadway. I'm broad. I'm large. I'm larger than large. How do you mean? Brickline Business International Vibes inside.